Hi, and welcome back after our holiday hiatus to the Knowledge Distillation podcast with me, Helen Byrne. 2024 is going to be a jam-packed year. More AI models, more scaling, more scaling laws. So I hope that we can bring you some interesting discussions to help keep track of what is happening. For our first episode of the year, I sit down with Florian Hunica, a principal AI engineer at Gina AI. Gina AI are building prompting tools and also embedding models. And Florian is doing the really interesting job of working at the intersection of the two, thinking about how they can use prompting of LLMs to generate synthetic data to train better embeddings. We dive into embeddings, what they're used for, and the Gina open source embedding models. And then we talk in depth about synthetic data, what it is, why use it, how to generate good quality synthetic data, and the potential problems with it. We'll definitely continue to see the rise of the use of synthetic data, so I think that this is a really interesting topic for us to discuss at the start of 2024. Hey, Florian, thanks for joining us on the Knowledge Distillation podcast today. It's great to see you again. Hey, Ellen, thanks for joining. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you if you could introduce Gina AI. I hope my pronunciation is correct. Maybe you can correct me if it's wrong. Um, I, I heard about you guys last year, and um, I'm really interested to understand the inspiration and the development of the company, um, what you guys are building, um, and how that's changed over time as well. Gina started as a neural search company. We were building vector database and also some services on top of vector databases. Mm. And at some point, we realized that search and generation is actually very close together. So it's a very similar interface. And the user might not even always be aware uh, when using a search application. Are the results, um, are they real or are they just generated? Interface is the same. They type in a search query, then get some responses. And for some applications, it might not be, it might not even matter if the results are gener generated, but factually correct or if there are some, some real data points on the internet. I think basically this um, generative AI is some kind of interpolation between real search results you would otherwise get. So that's why um, at some point we realized, okay, it's now going in a different direction. So we should investigate this gen AI path much more and then yeah, as it's uh, typical for a lot of startups, we made a couple of switches in our strategy. And now fully into this um, yeah, generative AI. And then um, yeah, my particular work is in basically co combining both departments. So we have the prompt technology department and also the embedding technology department. Even though they look a bit yeah, dissimilar from each other. What my work do is um, I'm bridging both of these by using prompt technology to generate training data for our embedding models. Can we start by talking about the embedding side? Um, and then I definitely want to ask you more about, uh, in particular, what you're doing, bridging the embeddings and the LLM space um, or generating um, embeddings using LLMs. But Let's start with embeddings. Um, it feels like a kind of natural place to start. So the you announced the 8K input embeddings last year. This was quite a popular post. I saw it come up on a number of feeds. Um, I think partly this was due, due to the input size being 8K, which is particularly large, and also the fact that they were open source. So um could you start by um, introducing us to embeddings? Um, what what are what are these embeddings used for? And then take us through your uh, model for your embeddings in particular. Yeah. So uh, when first looking at embeddings, it might not make any sense at all because what you do is some some well written text 
where someone took care of every word they wrote, converting it into a vector. What what cannot be used for for anything in the at least not for humans because we don't understand all these all these vectors. Maybe uh, convert it into a one thousand dimensional vector of just some pure numbers. And but for for the AI model, this is a so called meaningful representation of the text with some very interesting properties that we can use for our downstream task. So one of these properties is, uh, for instance, that in the Euclidean space, it has a very small distance to other sentences that might, that might use very different wording and phrasing, but have the exact or very similar semantic meaning. Then they are projected to a very similar space in very, very close to the other point in this Euclidean space. And you can guess for search systems, this can be highly relevant because when user types a search query and you retrieve all documents that are very close to that point in this high dimensional space, then these documents might be very relevant in answering the user query. So that's um, why retrieval systems really like using these vectors. And there are some vector databases building some efficient structure around these um, these embeddings, so that you don't have to calculate the similarity between all your million documents in your database or even more, but have some efficient index getting their, the nearest neighbors out of your database. And this is just not possible in uh, some uh, natural language space to build these indices. It's only possible when having vectors. So this is, this is like one, one big application. But it can also be used for other downstream tasks. Where once you have numbers, you can um, also train a classifier, for instance. So um, then you find um, a high dimensional uh, plane, like a hyperplane in this uh, high dimensional space, separating one, um, yeah, one category or, or one attribute of the category from the other attribute. And then you have your very cheap classifier. That's a great kind of introduction for um, the listeners as well on the, the, the uses that, that we have for these embeddings. Um, could you tell me about your the gene AI embeddings in, in particular, or the model? Um, what was the performance? Um, how does it look on the evaluation kind of benchmarking tables that everyone's referring to? Um, and in particular, I think I noticed it's a small, it's a fairly small model that you've that you've managed to to get these common embeddings. So yeah, so you you already mentioned there are two unique selling points. These are that it's very very small and can be can run very fast, which is um, yeah very very important for applica uh, for yeah, real world applications, and the token length, which at this point when it was released was unique. So now there are there are already uh, other models released that are even faster and also have a larger context window. But um, as it is in the AI space, the AI models already surpass state of the art for a while, and then the next models catch up. But on the other hand, we also will release a lot of models in the future, and then again catch up with uh, state of the art. There is this race going on, which I think is very productive because then um, every company using embeddings will benefit from this competition and then also find models that are particularly good, uh, good fit for their domain, where you cannot always use these general benchmarks. So for medical domain, one um, model might perform better than uh, for 
e-commerce domain, and so on. And for some businesses, context length uh, matters. For others, not so much. Then could you tell us what are the what are the use cases um, that you see where 8K context length is important? <laughs> so, yeah, for instance, for yeah, for e-commerce can be important when having very long, um, very long descriptions of yeah of the products, and but also for search cases like searching on scientific papers, then giving the whole abstract into the context or something. Yeah, where where it really uh, the model has some time to catch capture the whole semantics uh, and then you're not forced. So otherwise with a smaller context length, you're forced to build to chunk your paragraph into multiple sentences and then embed each sentence individually. But especially in things like an abstract, uh, you have to take everything as a whole because um, it's very, very dense information that everything relates to each other. Um, so maybe this leads on quite nicely to um, your um, your project that you're focused on, whereby you're actually using LLMs to generate or help generate the data that you're using to train the models. Um, is that specifically in for embeddings that you're doing this? Um generating the synthetic data or, or is it bigger picture using generating synthetic data for yeah, training for uh, for embedding models but also for re-rankers which is uh, almost the same kind of training data you would have and uh, maybe i quickly explain what a re-ranker is so um yeah as you can think I already said it's very difficult for a model to um, really um, distill all the information contained in like huge text channel eight k token uh, down to this just with this one vector, and it will make a lot of mistakes or will um, erase a lot of relevant information while doing this. There's no other way around. But we do this to have this very efficient index later. So it's, it's kind of a trade-off. And um, then what we do is we retrieve maybe the first uh, 1,000 or 100 documents that are very close or the, where the vector is very close to the input query. And then what you can assume is that the quality of these Let's say one thousand first results is not is not that good. So it it was fast to retrieve them, but there will be a lot of false positives in there. A lot of documents might just sound like they are relevant for this, but are then when you have a little more in depth read into this, then it turns out no, they are not. And that's why retrieval systems have multiple stages. And the other component I was talking about, the re-ranker, is for the second stage. And you can have many more stages of this re-ranking, but how it works is that in this stage, you know already that you just have very few documents compared to the stage before. Before you had millions, but now you have at least filtered them down to just thousands. So you can have um, now different trade-offs in terms of uh, quality of um, your ranking and um, the time it needs to, um, the, the performance, the runtime. And what you do then is you compare the query um, with each document. So, you're, so the re-ranker now doesn't just output an embedding for every data point, but instead it takes a query and the a document as input and outputs a score. How relevant is this uh, query to the document? And it allows the, the uh, re-ranker in the very early layers of the neural network to already um, yeah, feed, feed the information together and make some um, combined judgment about 
the query and the document and uh, is not forced to first erase a lot of information like the embedding model does. And but yeah, it, it takes longer and running this on a million documents would be a bad idea. But running this on a thousand documents then lets you filter out, out the false positives. So I generate uh, training data for these embedding models and re-rankers, which both need question-answer pairs for training. What do you mean when you talk about synthetic data, um, maybe more generally and um, specifically for these use cases? Yeah, so so the word synthetic data is a, a very nice word for fake data. Of course, I cannot uh, tell people I work on, on fake data, so I tell them I think fake has negative connotations. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Synthetic so, though. So it's basically, um, it's basically data that is not rooted directly to um, a real event in the real world, but it is um, kind of made up. And um, so it will surprise the listeners that actually uh, this is quite useful and that um, so Gardner predicts that by end of 2024, 60% of training data will be generated. So we we might ask, yeah, why uh, why why would we why would we do this? <laughs> generate more fake data and so on? Um, but the the thing is, the data that is actually generated is kind of an interpolation between real data, and we hope and we also should make sure that the data is always grounded to some some real world event that it's not entirely made up that would would actually um, d might might destroy the the training process so this has to be somehow um, similar to the distribution and is it simply because we want more data or are there other what are the other what are the other reasons why we would employ LLMs to create this data? This is an important point. So um, we actually kind of run out of um, high quality training data. So this is like yeah, running out. Um, it's we, we might also wonder why would we run out of training data where we have so many so much data more than we had ever. So the simple answer is the AI models are so data hungry that they just cannot get enough. So uh, when, you, when you just add additional synthetic data, it just might be very beneficial for a training process. So, but then there are, there are many other reasons actually. So the, um, the cost is very cheap. The factor can be multiple thousand times cheaper than it was before with human expert annotators. Um, then you can have very high volume on demand. So you decide today, I want to have my labeled data set, and then you can just ramp up some instances and uh, get the job done. Uh, get your labeled data, scale up, scale down, where with human annotators, this is very difficult. First, have to explain the task, and then, of course, wait some time until they're they're done with the job. Mm. Then there is also the part of uh, labels, labeling, well labeling. So these um, AI models can be much more consistent generating the synthetic data. Where I worked also in the past um, as annotator because I think every uh, ML engineer at some point uh, worked this labeler where you try to improve your model by just better, more high quality data. And I found it a very hard job being consistent over time. So when I when I started with the first labels, I, I diverged over time a lot from the original rules I set to myself when labeling. And this cannot happen to ChatGPT, and it changes its state. And I think the um, very important point is also that um, the, the labeling 
can be much more fair. So I don't mean like just by definition, synthetic data is more fair. I think it can go t t totally the other way around, where you just uh, just amplify stereotypes and generate data uh, that the model already thinks are are like this, and then even amplifies this. Uh, but with synthetic data, you have it all under your control, so you can also. Um, uh, take care that you so you can try to uh, make under otherwise underrepresented so you can try to make otherwise underrepresented examples just more common in your data set so with some model data you would uh, have underrepresented examples you would not even be aware of these but with synthetic data you could make them uh, just more more popular in your data set and so create more fairness. So you you kind of took touch on the benefits and the shortcomings. How are there special or um, kind of general techniques that you need to use to make sure or ensure that you're producing high fidelity, high quality data? Make sure that it's fair. Make sure that you're not missing the tails of the distribution. Are there principles there? Yeah, now, now we really go into a research. So this is an old field of research where at the moment no one really knows how to how to overcome this, um, how what is the best way of generating training data. But um, so what we could think of is the most simple approach is you just ask ChatGPT, please give me a list of 100,000 question answer pairs. And Obviously, um, this will quickly just run out of the context at some point, and it will uh, start with weird hallucinations or will just stop so after a few, few hundred uh, question-answer pairs. So th this is not the way to go. So what you then could do is asking it just multiple times. So chat UPT, be very creative and give me a list of just 10 question-answer pairs. And then you don't tell it, but you will do another instance, another run without knowing what you did before. And you will ask it again, give me 10 very unique examples. Now the problem here is a bit, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's not dumb. It's just um, lacking a bit in our creativity here because after already doing this three times, it will um, give out duplicates. So it will ask, what is the highest mountain? Uh, what is the uh, um, capital of France? And all these kind of questions, it will do over and over again. So with this method, uh, we just collected maybe 60 unique results. So <laughs> you, could, you could also play around with temperature and um, then make it make it diverge more, but yeah, there there are more more sophisticated approaches than this, and it's open research. Is that something that you're working on? Then the what are the techniques for prompting? I guess that really bridges the two parts of of Gina AI together. What are the best techniques for prompting LLMs to get high quality data? Yeah, yeah, yes. So, um, so the uh, techniques we came up with is um, based on this learning that it seems to, to lack a bit in inspiration. We need to give it some inspiration. And one possibility is to just give it some documents and ask it to generate the questions. So then we just generate half of it, half of the data set, but at least we make sure that there are not too many duplicates. And um, so everyone who wants to train a search or model used for search, betting model or re-ranking model, uh, usually also has training data because they want to search on something. So they can use these documents to generate queries. And so that's why we can assume the, the documents are always there. And yeah, th so this is one approach, but then also we can take 
user queries. User type in search for this, that. You can take these queries and then generate possible answers, possible um, documents that could be, the, be answering the query and therefore then create this question answer pair through this. But yeah, this, this also has some complications because um, when doing these kind of things, um, we diverge a bit from the actual distributions of what people searching for and the actual documents um, that are that are generated. So, so these um, the large language model will generate very clean questions with punctuation and uh, capitalization and without any spelling mistakes. And but this is in the synthetic data that is used to train a model that is then put into production and it will get very weird queries from the users. So it's also a challenge. I guess the the other thing I wanted to kind of ask you, which you've touched on there, are the challenges here. But there has been, last year, I remember seeing a number of um, kind of quite, Scaremonger is maybe too strong a word, but quite um, kind of dramatic posts about how we're running out of data. Um, at some point, it will be mostly synthetic data that these models are trained on, and they're kind of building these recursively um, degenerate models. Um, I think you mentioned that we... <laughs> we choose the kind of the highest quality outputs um, more consistently from, from these models. And, and these are the ones that we want to trade the model on to be a high quality model, but then we've lost the other um, data, the, the, the bad, um, um, the bad grammar questions, as you said, and things. And then you actually start your data, the distribution of your data starts to move, to, starts to, to drift and, and, and shift. Um, what, like, are, are you worried about this? What do you think about this as a as a problem in the future? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I get this point that um, there someone could be afraid generating training data and this training data trains the uh, model again and this kind of storyline I get. Um, but I, I think it's not um, what what currently is happening or what research is working on. So I see um, data generation more as a part of the distillation process. Distillation in machine learning means that you have a large model that can solve a task. And this model serves as a teacher for a small model. And what you do there is quite similar. So you give in certain documents from a database and ask the teacher, what is your output? Could be a classifier, it could be an embedding model. There, there will be some output, maybe a scalar or a vector, matrix, an image generation or something. And then you give the student the exact same input and also provide the output as training data. And what we do now with large language models, the new thing here is that large language models, we can give all kind of behavior. So we can act, uh, make it act as all these uh, different uh, models um, you, you would have uh, before. So we can tell it, act like being a classifier. And uh, when giving the sentence, you predict the mood and then you would get these, uh, get the mood prediction and take this mood for a smaller model, for a student model to learn that based on this input, um, this should be the expected mood and then adjust the weights accordingly. So to me, this is just distillation and should be also um, mostly yeah, used for this uh, case. So when you create training data, I would be very surprised to see um, a smaller model generating, acting as a teacher for a much larger model 
and generating training data that uh, can be relevant to this larger model. All, so there are some, um, some studies showing that you can improve the performance of a model by some kind of self-teaching. So it, it's a teacher and a student at the same time. Um, but, but what you do, do there is somehow uh, flattening uh, the uh, space of the loss and make it somehow maybe even amplifying stereotypes is the only thing you do to make it perform better on average. And um, I, I think this, uh, this is currently not what happening. People always go this... Um, distill a larger model to a smaller and use synthetic data for this. Um, could you look at it sort of the opposite way around, though, that um, you're using a smaller student model because it's, say, in the kind of idea of um, as we go on through generations and generations of building these models, the data that they're being trained on, a lot of it might have just been data that's been generated by their previous generation model, which will be a smaller, um, lower quality model. So the the teacher, in a sense, is now being taught from by the, the student data. Okay, so so you mean um, at some point this part of this uh, generated data get public on the internet and then someone trains a new large language model, finds a bot finds this data crawls it and and then uh then this is this becomes part of the training yeah this <laughs> this would be a problem we should not do this <laughs> I, think, I think it should be uh should become then very clear um yeah what what event is re really rooted to to some real world event otherwise it it diverges yeah uh, it, 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 it just sets then we can at least find out for the evaluation data sets, then we can at least find out um, if the new thing we created performs now better on real world events or not. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of um, slightly different topic questions so before we finish. So open source was one area. I know that Gina is quite passionate or open about open source. I know that you open source the embeddings, the 8K embeddings that, that were um, that you built last year. Um, what I, I wanted to ask you kind of personally or, or um, as, as a GINA represent, representative, why do you feel that open source is important? And yeah, what are you, what are you guys doing in the open source space other than the embeddings? So we're working on open source. Um, you get very fast feedback from from the people, from the real users. And if you would always have your model behind a paywall, then you must have a lot of marketing and a good standing. Only a few companies can then really sell their embeddings. But uh, people would be more hesitant trying these out. But when open sourcing it, we see in a few days uh, thousands of people downloading this and can make their experiments and also validate that we didn't make up our benchmarks, but um, that they're, they're actually um, really representing this uh, the quality of the models and then write blog posts about this and so on. And also, um, it, it puts here also under some kind of pressure because by by the time you release you're always you already have to think about the next step or maybe have the the next model um, already uh, trained but not released and um, because you you publish it and then all your competitors can catch up but you always already have to be one step ahead of this and um, this creates a very interesting work atmosphere also because everyone wants to push it out and uh, work on the next thing and creates a nice spirit, I have to say. 
And this is also part of why I, I like um, working with culture. And also, it's a good uh, personal exposure working open source. You can, uh, you're more invited to conferences, and um, so you get you give in the world, and you also get something back, right? Yeah, you collaborate more. Yeah, certainly. Great. Um, the other sort of another off topic. But obviously, you're based in Berlin. Um, and as another European tech company, I really wanted to ask, what is your experience as a European tech company? Could, do you, are you able to kind of compare um, what it would be like versus the US? The US is kind of go, going crazy in terms of funding and number of startups and everything else. Um, it feels like that to me anyway, com compared to, to us in Europe. What do you think? Um, and what do you think are the main differences there? Um, yeah, we couldn't find an investor here in Europe. So we have American investors. Wow. And uh, yeah, because they better understand the potential that we see as. And talking to European investors, it's more difficult. They want to have um, yeah, more shares. Yeah. Um, don't believe so much in the success of uh, ideas don't have the knowledge to really understand. So they're, they're more um, conservative. More conservative, yeah. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, I, so I mostly, so I work in this engineering role and uh, also do some talks from time to time. Um, but I, I'm not so involved in these business decisions and not in the conversation with investors. It's just some, some general knowledge I have. Why we choose American investors? Um, my final question for you um, is on 2024 kind of themes and predictions. And I mean, I don't need you to necessarily make a, a kind of a stand on, on anything, but what, where do you, like, what are you interested in? What do you think's coming? What are the themes of 2024, do you think? Yeah, what, what, I, what I think is, um, yeah, beside all these, Technologic uh, changes, or I think the next model will come out. It will surpass new benchmarks, right? And um, and then people will realize, oh no, it's it it can still not uh, do everything for us. Oh, what what a surprise! <laughs> and that's, this uh, force back will will go um, also this year, and I think even even for longer. And um, where we have very high expectation, and then. Um, yeah, and so my my person my personal so my personal interest is uh, most in um, maybe going also a bit to a more to political events, um, engaging more with people in general, because I think beside all these technical skills that have a very um, short lifetime some uh, new uh, technical innovations or so because uh, next month a new AI model will come out but uh, presenting yourself in public and also going into discussion with people trying to be more empathic and under un have getting more understanding of the real world getting more understanding of real world applications I think this is most of my goal for this year I think um, the diversity of teams is really important to me. So I think, yeah, being able to um, work and think about all the technical ideas, but also to work with people with different backgrounds, different skills, and communicate to them is equally important. Yes. Great. Well, thank you, Florian. This has been super interesting. Thanks for telling us about everything that you're interested in and getting up to. Thank you. Massive thanks to Florian. Go and check out the Gina AI embeddings. Play around with them, post and share feedback in the spirit of open source. If you enjoyed the episode, please leave us a review, subscribe and share with your friends and colleagues. You can also follow us on social media at Distillation Pod to stay up to date on all future episodes and message us with feedback and suggestions for future guests. Thanks for listening. Join us again next time.